So we are kicking off 21 days of prayer today. I'm super, super excited. I hope you are too, especially if you were with us back in January when we did the first uh, 21 days of, of prayer. That was good. It was a good experience. It was a learning experience for so many people if you were part of that. Because I don't know about you, but for so many people, when you say we're going to have an hour-long uh, prayer service in the morning, uh, some of you, the, those, those of you who are like, like me and your, your night owls rather than morning people, you're like, 6 a.m., are you for real? You know, But a lot of people think to themselves, it's like an hour, like, what are we going to do? What are we, how, I don't know that I can pray for an, an hour. And then it's 21 days as well, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, and so, I mean, we, we have these presumptions about what prayer is and what it looks like. And I got to get on my knees for the, you know, 60 minutes or so. If you're old like me, I, I can't get on my knees for 60 minutes. It hurts too much. You know, it's just not comfortable. And uh, if you're not comfortable, you're probably not going to be able to focus uh, praying as, as well. And so, so it was an incredible experience in January learning that there's just not one way of praying, you know, that, that prayer is so much more than God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, which does not rhyme, by the way, I just have to say that. So, um, and, and, and so we want you to discover, we want you to discover how to pray comfortably, because I believe if, if you can figure out how to pray comfortably, you'll pray more. Right? And, and, and so there were so many discoveries back in January. And I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to share some comments from folks who uh, were part of 21 Days of Prayer this last January uh, with you and how that affected them and their lives. Check out the screen. During the 21 Days, it was really cool to be able to see how um, a lot of prayer requests were brought forward. Um, and through the 21 days, a lot of prayers were actually answered. Um, and you could actually see God working through each one of those little uh, instances that were brought up. One thing that stuck out to me about 21 days of prayer was just seeing people's heart to want to get closer to the Lord and actually come and take time out of their life to actually go and, and worship together to pray and give our, our thoughts, our, our thankfuls and everything up to the Lord. Something that stuck out to me was probably um, just like the different prompts helped me to see ways that I wasn't praying for people and um, ways that I could be praying for people. One of the aha moments I had during the 21 days of prayer is I know everybody prays, but you never really get a chance to see everybody else and what their prayers are. And it, it just, it brings you together as a people to pray for one another and just kind of support each other through that time. It really, I think it helped me to be more intentional on, on praying a certain time of day. Um, and then seeing how those prayers were working in people's lives. I really liked waking up early and actually like doing something before going to school and praying because then it it almost like started my day with something positive and it like helped me throughout the day and I really missed that because I didn't really uh, keep that trend so I'm excited for the new one because Hopefully, even after the 21 days of prayer, it can uh, give me a new routine to start like doing. So that was really cool for doing the 21 days of prayer. That's it, y'all. That's, that's, that's why we're doing this, okay? Be because, and, and I won't ask you to raise your hands, but uh, I've, I've had several people kind of share with me a little bit of, I love 21 days of prayer, and, and I had the best of intentions, right, to continue that and make it a habit in my life, and I did at first for a week or a few weeks or maybe a month or two or so, and it just kind of dwindled off. And, and so exactly what Peyton said right there at the end of that video is exactly why we're doing it again. Uh, so we can just kind of build this habit, this culture of prayer into our lives individually and as a, uh, a church. I totally forgot to share in the first service uh, that up front here on each corner there are prayer cards. There's a, 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 a cup of pens as well. And so after the service, uh, if you have a prayer request, come up here and just write that down and share that with us. Those will be up here for the next three weeks as well uh, for, for every single day during the prayer services for people to share their prayer requests. And they will stay up front, uh, unless you mark confidential on there, they will stay up front for people to walk up day after day after day, lay hands on and pray over uh, for the next three weeks, which is pretty amazing. So I'm really, really excited uh, about 21 days, but it, uh, also about this, this message series. I was looking, I shared in the first service, I was looking back over my, my notes from... 
uh, past years on uh, prayer and everything, and, it, and I realized uh, I've never done an entire message series just on prayer. Uh, and I've done like a whole message on prayer, or there's been chunks of, uh, that are parts of, of a message that's been on prayer, but not an, an entire message series. And so I'm really, really excited about this series that we're going to have for the next four, maybe five weeks, because I think I might split the, the last Sunday in, in, in half. So, um, but I'm excited because I think prayer can be confusing. Because I, I think a lot of times we grow up uh, from, from kids and we think we have to have all of the right things to say and, and, you know, how often am I supposed to pray? And if I don't pray that often, then I feel guilty about it. And there's just all of these variables that kind of play into this topic of prayer. And like I said earlier, there's just no one way of praying. Everybody prays differently. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to look at several prayers from Scripture. Uh, we're going to look at the New Testament church prayer in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to look at the shepherd's prayer from Psalm 23. Next week, we're going to look at one of my favorite prayers, which is the prayer of Jabez. And uh, today, we're going to look at the prayer of Moses. Some people call it the tabernacle prayer from the book of, of Exodus. Prayer's kind of evolved, hasn't it? Uh, over many years, uh, I, I'm sure everybody here, if you are a follower, if you're a believer, you've experienced the prayer circle, haven't you? Right? You know, at the end of your group, at the end of your Sunday school class or whatever it is, everybody gets in a school, uh, in, in a circle and, and you hold hands, right? And the, and the leader says, I will start and we'll go around the circle. Anybody who wants to pray can pray. And then this person right here is going to wrap up for us, right? And, and it, as we go around, if you don't want to pray, what do you do? Squeeze a hand, right? You squeeze a hand of the person next to you and it moves on to the next person, you know? What well, was always horrible, like you had to be uh, intentional and strategic where you are, where you place yourself in the circle, right? Because if you were towards the end, it comes around to you and it's like, everybody's already prayed for everything that I planned on praying, right? I have no new content here whatsoever. I don't know what to pray, you know? And, uh, and, and then like, like there was a, uh, the last church that we were at, like they like huddled up, you know? It wasn't hand in hand, like they put arms around each other. It was like a brotherhood of, uh, you know, a brotherhood and a sisterhood of, of believers sort of thing. And then what happened? COVID flipped prayer like upside down, didn't it? Now we can't hold hands. We can't be in a circle. It's like a conglomerate of people, you know, sort of thing uh, when it comes to prayer. And, and I'm hoping and my desire is over the next several weeks, maybe we can get back to just really authentic genuine prayer in our individual lives and in our groups as a church uh, collectively as well. If you're familiar with a little bit of Old Testament uh, history, biblical history, you know about the Israelites. They were God's people and they were living as slaves in Egypt, living in captivity. God goes to this guy named Moses and says, Moses, you're my guy. You're going to be my leader to lead my people out of uh, captivity. You're going to lead them to this amazing land called the promised land. It's called the promised land because God promised it to them. And, uh, and there's a journey that should have only taken two, three weeks ish or so. And it took them 40 years right? Because they start wandering. They just start going all over the place. I mean, they get messed up, then they get back on track. They get messed up, then they get back on track. Probably similar to most of our stories as, as well, you know. And God's intent was for them to get to the promised land and build a temple. He wanted them to build a, a temple uh, when they got there, a place where they could worship and a place where God could dwell. Because back in ancient times, God dwelt in the sacred buildings. Today it's different. God, through his Holy Spirit, lives inside of each of us. It's a very personal thing. Back then that wasn't the case. And, and so, so God's people, they're, they're going to build this temple when they get to the, the promised land. Well, in the meantime, in between now and the point that we get to the promised land and can build the temple, we need a portable one. And so back in their day, the one at the promised land, the permanent one, would be called the temple. The portable one is called the tabernacle. That's all it is. We find in Exodus chapter uh, 25, beginning with verse 8, God says, Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. There is a pattern in here. And I want to see today if maybe we can draw some insight out of this pattern that we might be able to apply to our prayer lives. 
as well. Now, I, I've, I've got a picture for you, a couple pictures for you today, not one now and one at the end. This is kind of a, re, uh, it is a representation, although I, I don't think back then they had the electric panel, just just saying, you know, um, a good representation of what the tabernacle would have been, okay? It was this rectangle sort of area where people would enter. There's a tent uh, towards the back, and then at the back of the tent, that was where uh, the Ark of the Covenant was, where God dwelled. And, and they would enter into this, this rectangular area, the tabernacle, and they would go through stages or, or uh, stations, if you will, you know, sort, sort of thing, preparing themselves to meet God, to approach approach God. Uh, we find in Exodus chapter 33 in the back part of that tent, it says, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Can you imagine that? Like sitting, like, can you imagine having a conversation with God and you, you both got a cup of coffee in your hands or you're sitting around the lunch table or getting some Christian chicken at Chick-fil-A or something like that, you know, and God's just talking with you. Can you imagine that? Face to face like that? That would be amazing. I believe over the next 21 days that we have together in prayer, that someone, hopefully multiple people, will experience what it's like to have the face to face encounter with the living God. And I'm guessing, I bet, if you have that encounter with God, you experience what it's like to pray and, and speak with him face to face, you just might pray more often. I want to share with you a model of prayer this morning. I learned this from Pastor Chris Hodges at Church of the Highlands. He learned it from his mentor. It's been around for a while. You might be familiar uh, with it. Uh, but before I jump into it, I want to be clear uh, that what was the law in Old Testament scriptures is not still law for you and me today. Jesus Christ came, he brought a new way for us sort of thing. However, I believe there's some invaluable learnings, meanings that we can take from Old, Old Testament accounts and, and scriptures. And so what I want to give you today is just a model. It's not law. It's not you have to pray like this. I'm not boxing you in, okay? It's, it's just a model. It's a pattern like, like we read earlier, it's a pattern, a good pattern for prayer. And I'm telling you, there, there's, there's several pieces. There's seven pieces to this. If you got the, the outline, you see that there's seven points with blanks that we're going to fill in. There's a lot that we're going to go over. But I'm telling you, if you only take the first two today, if all you remember is the first two things out of what I'm going to share with you today, it could dramatically alter your prayer life altogether. That's how huge these first two things, I mean, all of them are huge. But if you only remember the first two, I think it will be good for you. As the Israelites would, would walk into the tabernacle, into this rectangular area, there's, there's several pieces of furniture that they would go from one to another to another. As they step through from the outside to the inside, that was considered the outer court. They're in the outer court now, and at, as they stepped through, they would give thanks. That's the outer court for us. As they walked from the outside of the tabernacle through the great gates into what they call the outer court, there was one focus in mind. Let's show gratefulness towards our God. Now, let me just ask you a question. 30 minutes ago, 60 minutes ago, maybe or so, depending on how long you've been here. As you walk through the doors of the church, whether it was there on the front doors or the back door, what was your mindset? Were you sad? hurting because of just junk going on in life, mad, angry because of something that happened? Or did you walk through those doors grateful, grateful for something? When it, when it comes to our prayer life, according to this model, the very first thing that we do is we just express our gratefulness to God for how he has blessed us. Studies have shown there is this literal rewiring of our brains when we focus on uh, things that we should be grateful for rather than all of the negative things in life. You know, rather, rather than the argument you had with your spouse or, or my boss just drives me crazy or whatever it is, rather than focusing on those, I'm gonna focus on all of these blessings, all of the, the things I'm gonna be grateful for. And every single one of you, you have at least one thing to be grateful for. 
I'm telling you, no matter who you are, no matter how, what life has dealt uh, to you, you have something. It, and it doesn't have to be spiritual, all like holier than thou sort of things, you know? I mean, it could be, it's a gorgeous day out there. I thought it was supposed to storm and pour down rain today, you know, on, on, on this Sunday, you know, looking at the weather app the other day. But it's gorgeous out there. Thank you, God, for this day. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you know, God, thank you for, for my car is breaking down, but it at least got me to church this morning. You know, what, what are you grateful for? Every single one of us, there's something to be grateful for. And as we enter through those gates, into his courts, into his presence, we need to be grateful, thankful. Psalm chapter 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. We're going to begin with thanksgiving. We're just going to thank God for all of his many blessings. And and here's what I want you to do, because I know, because I get this, because I've been there just like you have. We all have. Life just deals a lot of junk. And and, and oftentimes, it's all at the same time, you know. Um, There's just hurt, and there's pain, and there's loss, you know. When, When that happens... I want you to remember this quote from a very wise man uh, in my life named my dad. My dad, if you haven't heard his story, was in a very severe car accident when I was in middle school, almost took his life, and as a result, for the next 25 years or so, suffered from very severe migraine headaches that put him in a dark room almost every single day with an ice pack on his head. And I can remember several times just asking him, how do you deal with that much pain. And every single time, here's what he said. You know, you never have to look around very long to find someone in worse shape than yourself. And and, and I want to minimize what you're going through because it's very real. But there's some truth to that. You don't have to look around very long to find someone in worse shape than yourself. What are you thankful for today? What are you grateful for? Gratefulness isn't all that difficult. It becomes difficult when we're too consumed with ourselves. After uh, you enter through the gates of thanksgiving, they would come to this altar. It's called the brazen altar. Some people call it the bronze altar altar. And uh, I'm not going to show you a picture of this because it's gross. Okay. It's just disgusting uh, because this is where they sacrificed animals. Okay. This is where they burnt animals. It would have been, it just would have been nasty. I'm telling you. Okay. Um, and the reason why they had to do that, and, and don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this going in, coming into the second one. All right. And I'm telling you, if you remember number one, I'm going to be grateful, right? I'm going to be thankful for, there's at least one thing I'm going to be grateful for. And then the second one you remember, here's, here's the reason why they had to do that. It was because they knew that blood was required to be spilled for the sins they had committed. And so for you and me today, the second thing that we have to focus on is the cross. We have to focus on the cross. For for them back then, it was a reminder that something had to die for them to draw close to God. For you and me today, it's a cross. It's, It's not an animal. It's not a something. It's a someone named Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, who shed his blood, spilled his blood for you and for me so that we may approach God, so that we may have that experience of what it's like to talk to God face to face. Paul says this in Romans chapter five, verse six, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. The only reason you and I have the ability and honor and privilege to go before our holy God is because Jesus Christ spilled his blood for you and me. Isaiah chapter 53, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. No matter what your prayer model is, I think, I think we'd be doing pretty good in every single prayer, to be thankful and to remember the cross. Those two things right there alone, before we ever get to the point of offering our laundry list of prayer requests, so-and-so is sick and this is going on and that's going on, we're thankful and we focus on the cross. 
After the, the altar, they come to this thing called a, a, a laver, and it's basically this giant large bowl filled with water where they would wash themselves. They would be, have, to, have to get clean before they approach God. And, and what is kind of weird to me about it, and, and symbolic as, as well, is the whole bottom of it is layered with mirrors so that as you are going down and you're washing yourself, you have to stare at your reflection. You have to look at your Self. And it's a reminder that we need to offer every part of our lives to God. Every part, not just partial, not just a little bit, not just one or two parts of our life, but every single part. I, was, I remember the story I was told years ago uh, about a guy who came forward at the end of a service and wanted to be baptized. And so him and the pastor went backstage and they got changed, put on the white robes that we used to wear and everything. And, uh, and, and they walked down and stepped down into the baptistry, into the water. And, and the pastor didn't realize that the guy had a death grip on something in his hand. And so they, they went through the whole thing. If you've seen how we do baptisms, you know, they take the confession of faith and then the pastor puts his arm around, around the guy and, and, uh, and says, you're now baptized in the name of the Father and, you know, that, that whole part and begins to take him underwater. And this guy with a death grip of something in his hand, he shoots it straight up so that his hand cannot go under the water. And we find out later that his death grip was on his wallet. True story too, by the way. And the pastor asked him afterwards, he said, what's up with that? Holding your wallet in your hand and, and, and all. And, and he literally said, well, I'm willing to give God every part of my life, just not that part. That's another sermon for another day. We can go off on that for a while. But we need to offer every part of our lives. It's one of the things I love about baptism when you do it properly and you fully are, are submerged under, uh, un, underwater. Every part is washed clean. We have to offer every part, not just some, every part to God. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. He says, I urge you, I urge you. In other, in other words, this isn't something that can wait. This isn't something that you can stop and smell the, the roses before you do this. I urge you, you gotta do this now. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, what is true and proper before God is when you offer 100% of your life to him, not just part. So we're going to pray with thanksgiving. We're going to be grateful. We're going to remember the cross. We're going to remember and, and that, that God wants all of us, all of our lives. We're going to recommit all of our lives to him. It's not, this isn't law. It's just a model for uh, what you could do in, in your prayers. And, and next you get to go into that little tent, okay? You go in the, the first part of that little tent and inside of there is this big candlestick. And you've seen candlesticks like this before, okay? You got the, the centerpiece coming up and then you have all of these branches coming off of it. There's, there's like seven different places for, for candles, okay? Old and New Testament, a candlestick, this is gonna surprise you, it represented fire, duh. But more importantly, it represented power, and it represented anointing. It represented the Holy Spirit. And so as we come to the candlestick, it's our opportunity to invite the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, let's be honest, okay? If you, if you grew up in a church like ours, I did up in Indiana, grew up in a, in a, in a Christian church just like ours, you know, we, we have not spent a whole lot of time talking about Holy Spirit type things. Because years ago, there were other churches and individuals who like took the Holy Spirit to a huge extreme over here and things just got really weird, right? And it kind of scared us. And, and, and so we took everything to the opposite extreme and, and we don't even, we don't even like, like do much with the Holy Spirit at all, you know? And, and I think either extreme is dangerous, there needs to be a balance in the middle. But I think for many of us, if you grew up in a, in a church like ours, for, for many of us, we've taken the Holy Spirit and put him in a closet and shut the door and locked it and, and threw away the key. Because it's kind of scary sometimes because it just gets a little, a little weird, right? And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit would love to work in your life. Can, can I just ask you, a rhetorical question. When is the last time in your prayers you prayed and invited the Holy Spirit to work in your life? 
Like, I, I don't know how many times somebody's come to me throughout the years that I've been in ministry and it's like, I just don't know what to do. This is the decision I'm facing. I don't know whether to go over here or go over there. I don't know what to do. And I'm just like, have, have you asked the Holy Spirit just to kind of give you that wisdom to be able to figure that out? And they're like, what do you mean by that? And the Holy Spirit can help you. Your decisions, the Holy Spirit can help you be grateful. When's the last time you invited the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Not only that, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you received the gift of the Holy Spirit, you received a spiritual gift that God wants you to use as well. God doesn't want you to just, just kind of sit on the sidelines. And, and, and in fact, in, in first or Second Timothy, it says, this is why I remind you to flan, fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. Fan, if you don't fan it into flames, it is going to burn out. It is going to be gone. It's going to be useless. In other words, God did not call us to just sit in the chair or sit on the sidelines with our little spiritual gift and not use it at all. Because if you don't, you lose it. Fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hand, my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Maybe for some of you, the main takeaway for you today is I just haven't been living under the influence of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I need to. I need to invite him back in to be the main driving influence in my life. After, after this part, you come to this table. And uh, as, as I read through this and I think about this, uh, I, for me, uh, I have this memory, if you, if you will, of, of walking into, at least for us in, in our Walmart on Highway 29, there's a subway there. And the bread smells amazing. Doesn't it? Like every time you walk into like a subway, the bread just smells absolutely heavenly. I'm not a subway fan. I like other sub places, but, but, but the bread just smells amazing. Or uh, I, I can remember Amanda used to have one of those automatic bread makers. Maybe you still have one of those. You know, you dump everything in there and it swirls around and kneads the bread and then it bakes it. And you walk in to your home and it smells heavenly from the bread, right? You know? And, and so you walk over to this table and there on this table are 12 uh, freshly baked loaves of bread. Didn't know the tabernacle was a bakery, right? You know, 12 loaves right there. And, and, and it's the table of shoe bread, which is where we can claim the promises in God's word. We focus on God's word and the promises in God's word. The table represents the word of God. And, and here's what's going to happen. When you begin to focus on the word of God, you're going to begin to see the promises of God in the word of God. Jesus said this when he was tempted. He said, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's word should be life to us. And if I don't get it, I will wither up. Like, think about this from a physical perspective, right? You know, how long can you go without actually putting a, a physical substance of food inside of your body? How long will it be before you just begin to shrivel up and fade away? It's exactly the same thing with your soul, with your spirit. It ought to, God's word is your nourishment. It is life. And if you do not partake in that nourishment, you will wither up and dry up. You just will. Some of you here today is like, that's me right now. I'm all withered up. I need some life. It's right there. It's God's word. Focus on those promises again. We're almost, we're almost to God, okay? We almost get to, to approach, we're at that point to approach God in the tabernacle. But the next one, I love this one, is the altar of incense. And this is where we worship his name. Josh alluded to that earlier in that song that we sang, the incense. This is the sweetest smell to God. His favorite aroma, singing songs like we sang earlier, praising our God, worshiping our God, declaring our love for him and his love for us, pouring our hearts out to him. There is absolutely nothing that smells better to God. Now, when I hear the word incense, 
Amanda and I were talking about this earlier uh, this week. Uh, and when I was talking about what we were speaking about today, when, when, when I hear the word incense, I don't necessarily think of a great thing. When I think of incense, I think of the other smell that you're trying to cover up with the incense. You know what I'm talking about? Marijuana, smoking weed. That's what I'm talking about, just in case you were wondering, okay? You know, that's, when I hear the word incense, that's what I'm thinking about. But think about this. Just like with that, you're trying to cover up a bad smell. You don't want somebody else to smell what you've been doing. Our incense, our worship to God covers up how dirty, how smelly, how sinful of a people we are. That's what worship does. It gets us ready to approach God, to see him, to come before him face to face. I love this quote from, from Chris Hodges. He says, when you praise God, you praise him for what he has done. When you worship God, you worship him for who he is. I love that. Psalm chapter 95 Verses six and seven says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people. He watches over the flock under his care. All right, let's, let's review real quick. Again, isn't how you must pray, just a great model uh, for, for prayer. We start with Thanksgiving. I'm gonna be grateful, right? We remember the cross, I'm going to be grateful for that, but we focus on that cross and what Jesus did for us. We offer our entire lives to God. We make that recommitment. God, all of me is for you. We invite the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We digest some of God's word. We focus on the promises of God and we worship him. And then finally, we get to the Ark of the Covenant. And this is our opportunity to intercede for others. Ark of the Covenant. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen Indiana Jones, right? I got a picture of this one for you because I want you to see this, okay? This is a great representation of that. Uh, but on the Ark of the Covenant, there's two angels. They're bowed down towards the center. Their angels, or their, their wings are coming over. Their eyes are closed. And this center point of the Ark is called the mercy seat. And the reason that the angels are bowed over like that and their eyes are closed is because they believed that it was in the mercy seat in the middle of there. That is where God always sat. That's where they could approach God. Here's what I love about this model of prayer, you get to this point, you're prayed up. Like, there's, like, you know, it's not just a couple of things you've prayed for. I mean, there's a, there's a giant list of things that you've gone through. You've prayed up. You're overflowing at this point. You're fired up. You're pumped up. You, you've worshiped, right? And you're ready to go. And then this is the point that you begin to intercede for everybody else. This is the point that you get to pray for uh, whatever is on your list, whomever is on uh, your list. First Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, I urge you. I wonder how many times Paul says urge. Like, things are urgent in his mind. Right? I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Friends, here, here's the bottom line for today. I've said this before. You've probably heard this before as well. Prayer should, not be our, prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. It should always be what we do first. In, 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 a, in a, a struggling situation, you're like, we got to pray. It's not your last resort. Just like Peyton said in, in that, that video, I'm gonna wake up in the morning, it's gonna be the very first thing that I do. I'm gonna, it's gonna become a habit in my life. It's gonna be my trend. That's the word that he used, right? You know, that's, that's who I am. That's, that's what I'm gonna do. My very first thing, it's, it's not my last resort. We give thanks. We focus on the cross. We worship him. We intercede for all these things that we talked about today. Now, check this out. I want to give you a very practical, tangible takeaway today for most of you. And I say most of you because you need a smartphone in order to do this, okay? So for most of you, you can do this. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to download this app. It's called the Pray First app. 
Pray First, okay? You can get it on the App Store, on Google, uh, wherever you get your apps sort of thing, okay? Church of the Highlands released this, uh, and it's not just for their church, it's for everybody around the entire globe. It's an incredible tool for us uh, as well, especially throughout this prayer series and 21 Days of Prayer. There are all kinds of prayers listed in there. Everything that I just went over in this tabernacle prayer is listed in there. Every single one of these pieces of furniture, what it is, the description about them, and then also uh, like an example of a prayer at each one of these things that, that you might say, and you can make that your own. Prayer of Jabez is in there that we'll look at next week. There's so many incredible things in this app for you to be able to, to utilize, and it's called Pray First for a reason, so that hopefully you'll pray first, right? Because prayer should always be our first response, not our last resort. Let's practice this prayer right now. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you. There are so many things for us to be grateful for. Father, from the beautiful day that you gave to us today, to this place that we can worship in, Father, the seats that we can sit in, the friends that we have right here, the community that we have, people we can trust in. God, you've blessed us in so many ways and we are so grateful to you. As the provider in our lives, we are so grateful to you. God, we thank you for the cross. Father, none of us can even begin to fathom what your son Jesus Christ went through on the cross. We are grateful today for the cross. Today we take our focus off of ourselves and we place our focus on your son Jesus Christ and the cross. Thank you for the blood that was spilled for our sins that washes us clean, that gives us hope not only in the next life but in this one now as well. God, we offer our lives unto you not just part of them, but all of our lives. Right now, in this moment, we recommit our lives, our hearts, our souls, God, every part of our lives, we recommit to you. God, we invite the Holy Spirit to be part of our lives. God, I know there's probably a handful of people here today. That's the main thing that they need. They need to let the Holy Spirit out and and be an influence once again in their lives, God. I pray that that you will use your Holy Spirit in their lives in in a mighty way. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives, into our relationships, into our church, Father God. And God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word. God, we stand strong upon your promises. We stand firm upon your word. And God, we worship you today. Yahweh, God, we, we, we worship you. We praise you as the creator of the universe. You are worthy as we sang earlier. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Sometimes that's all we can say is you are worthy of it all. We are not, but you are. And now, Father, I pray for every single person in this room right now. I intercede for every single person in this room. I pray for every marriage represented in this room, everyone that is struggling, everyone that wrestles to keep Jesus Christ at the center of their relationship. I pray for their children. I pray for the health of their kids. God, I pray for every single kid who's going back to school this week, every teacher who will teach in the schools this week. I pray for their safety on every single campus throughout our county and the next, God. I pray for every person who's hurting in some way, shape, or form for every single illness that they are wrestling with for the COVID junk going around, God. I pray for every single financial hardship that people are wrestling with, for that car that they just can't seem to get repaired, God. For every single person here in this room, God, I pray for your hand to rest upon each one, upon each person, upon each relationship, and upon this church. I pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, y'all, let's continue to worship.